It was written 3,000 years ago, Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I will do a new thing, even make a way in the wilderness. And although in the past there were also those who said the future is written in the stars, today it is reasonable to believe that the future will be written, not in the stars perhaps, but surely in the far reaches of the wilderness we call space. In making a way to space, the fire in the tail of liftoff, exciting though it may be, represents only a small part of the total problem, of the total work. Our success depends on more than launching a spacecraft into orbit. Success is measured by what we learn. Most of what we learn comes from the highly specialized instruments carried in our spacecraft. And the findings of these space laboratories are transmitted to us here on Earth on a communications lifeline. In the space flights of our astronauts, nearly all of us have had first-hand experience with space communications. But perhaps even more dramatic and even more memorable were the times when, for various reasons, communications were cut off, when the lifeline was temporarily severed, and the only response from space was silence. Go ahead, Cape. Uh, you're drowned. You're going out. But there was time to re-establish communications. And yet even after the happy news of re-entry was confirmed, we still remembered the waiting and the silence. In military operations, silence can be fatal. The importance of a communications lifeline has been summed up in exactly 11 words by Air Force General Thomas S. Power. Without adequate communications, all I command is my desk. We can be sure that potential military advantages and needs of space are apparent to more than a single nation. Technology is competitive, and time itself has become a weapon. A system that would operate on an occasional or when convenient basis would be no system at all in terms of national defense. Military space systems must be operational 24 hours a day, so, acting on behalf of all the people, our Congress approves and appropriates necessary funds. The Department of Defense has assigned many space programs to the Air Force. Direct development is under management of the Space Systems Division, Air Force Systems Command. In the development of military space systems, the backbone of our communications lifeline is a vast network of men and machines spread over half the globe. Tracking stations tie in and are controlled by the 6594th Aerospace Test Wing with headquarters at Sunnyvale, California, where the Satellite Tracking Center has coordination and command responsibility from launch to completed mission. After launch and injection in orbit, our tracking stations let us determine where each spacecraft will be at every given moment of time, so that we know in advance exactly when each spacecraft will come within contact range of a specific station. Then the station can communicate with it to acquire information from it, to send commands to it, and to control it. In preparation for contact, information, roughly the equivalent of a 100-page book, is sent by the control center at Sunnyvale to the tracking station by teletype, voice, and high-speed data lines sometimes just moments before the spacecraft will be in range. In the minutes that follow, the station must receive the spacecraft's reports 
and in turn forward them to the tracking center. And those in charge realize that they must make decisions vital to the operation's life or death now, immediately, in the real time of the present. Ultra high speed electronic computers help them assimilate and analyze the information from space. Then from many predetermined courses of action that have been prepared in advance, one is chosen. Coded instructions are transmitted back to the tracking station in time to be communicated to the spacecraft before it passes out of radio range. After one spacecraft has passed, the men must often prepare to track another one, one whose mission may be completely different and require different equipment and procedures, one that may be in control range within 30 minutes or less. In our relatively brief history in space, more than 100,000 commands have been transmitted and executed. Yet an efficient tracking and communications network, operating routinely around the clock and global in nature, is only a part of our lifeline to space, only a part of the human and material resources working to make a way in the wilderness. Behind the scenes, across the nation, our resources of industry and our scientists and engineers are working with and for the Department of Defense and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And just as we need highly trained people to operate our equipment in the field, we need the creative ingenuity of equally dedicated people who design and build that equipment. The technical accomplishments and disciplined management techniques for advancing the space sciences may really be understood by only a relatively few. But what is being accomplished is important to everyone. New projects or programs always begin with stated requirements. And long before the engineers in drafting rooms go to work, a program manager and his staff have translated requirements into ideas for hardware and systems. Systems are difficult to define. They can include many things. A system can include the design and integration of a complete tracking station that covers acres of ground. A system can include a high-speed computer of advanced design that fills a large room. A system can include a space-borne transmitter, small enough to fit in a hand. But the constant factor is reliability. It has always been clear to the managers of our national efforts in space that reliability from concept to finished product has to be designed in and built in. It is management's responsibility to achieve maximum reliability as well as efficiency and economy. Design and manufacturing are two steps. A third is the critical examination and decisive trial of testing. For the present, vehicles in space are beyond the reach of repairmen with spare parts. For test programs never before equaled in scope or thoroughness, equipment is devised to duplicate in the laboratory the environment of space. There is the almost total vacuum, the blistering heat of the sun's direct rays unfiltered by the atmosphere. And there is also the absolute zero cold of space, encountered by a spacecraft passing in the shadow of the Earth. Men living and working on the ground send the products of other minds and other hands out into the wilderness, into the three-dimensional world of orbital flight. In our lifeline to space, the precision instruments we call antennas play a vital role. This one at Philco's Western Development Laboratories is 60 feet in diameter. It tracks automatically. It transmits and it also detects signals from the infinite distances of space. The craftsmanship and quality standards represent a national effort because an associate contractor of a program will subcontract much of the work to literally thousands of small and medium-sized companies across the country. Under operating conditions, an antenna must be able to face the buffeting of wind and move on its axis with almost unbelievable precision in order to locate and to receive signals unerringly 
without fading from spacecraft traveling many thousands of miles an hour. But today, just as they have always been, people are our greatest resource. No matter how complex the electronics, humans sit in the driver's seat. They control the operations. Machines help, but men make the decisions. Human factors, human capability, must be tied into the system right along with engineering design of the system. To minimize the chance for human error, human factors engineers are brought in right at the beginning of the design phase. Because a man on duty must be attentive for hours, his performance can be influenced by the angle of his chair, the illumination of dials, the arrangement of consoles. In addition to automatic checkout equipment, there must also be complete checkout procedures for men to follow to be sure that equipment designed to do a job can be maintained to keep on doing the job. Out in the field, men and hardware come together. Through training and plain hard work, they become a smoothly operating team. In charge of installation and checkout are seasoned engineers of WDL's field activation laboratories. Some of them will stay on to operate remote tracking stations together with Air Force personnel. For many of us, on a day-to-day -day basis, it may be difficult to observe the way that is being made in the wilderness. But today, the Department of Defense, through the Air Force, has, in being, a proven operating space test system to support all military research and development space programs. Today, thanks to our global satellite control facility, on a routine around-the-clock basis, we can carry on a variety of space tests. With a single network, we can, simultaneously, monitor many active satellites in orbit. And as our spacecraft increase in size and efficiency, this single global network will continue to pay dividends. Because regardless of size or complexity, even manned spacecraft are dependent on a reliable lifeline of communications. That fire in the tail of liftoff is still a breathtaking sight. But it is only the beginning, the beginning of a long, long journey. Air Force General Ben Funk puts it this way. In true perspective, we have just taken our first steps into space. These steps represent a backlog of experience and knowledge, most of which has come to us on our communications lifeline. What we have learned through experience is making it possible for us to develop systems for our national defense. Military operations on the ground and in space depend on an interference-free communications lifeline. Men must talk to men. Instruments must transmit their findings. Photographic and TV pictures must be relayed. We have experience and we have the most valuable asset of all, people. People with experience and with the necessary education on which to build more and more experience. I am confident that our lifeline to space is in good hands. <laughs>